Brooks Davis, um, and I am here today to talk to you about the surprisingly complicated piece of engineering that is Hello World. Um, in this talk, I will well, begin to skim the surface of the complexity. There will be a bunch of things like malloc that I'm going to hand wave about it and say, yeah, it's magic, um, because that's a whole other talk. Um, and my suspicion at this point, having written the paper, is that you could write something about Hello World that varies in depth from the paper I wrote for the conference to Greenland's site book. Um, so um, there's a there's a lot to, lot to learn. So let's uh, let's dive in. Um, but first, I'm going to give you a little background as to what we're doing here. So I wanted to under I set out to learn about Hello World and well how C programs work in general. Um, so that I can change the way we do it on 3BSD and change it in general. Um, the reason that I'm doing these changes is that I'm working on a research project uh, with uh, SRI International at the University of Cambridge, um, where we, are, we have built a MIPS 64 compatible CPU, which has, remember, which has extensions that make buffer overflows a thing of the past. All you have to do is recompile your code and make it slightly more correct um, in the process. Um, mostly things like not using pointer diff t when you mean int pointer t, um, a few subtle things. But for most things, for instance, um, OpenSSH, you just recompile it, you get something that has that should not have any buffer overflows, and they will be hardware exceptions. There is one. Um, and in addition to that, our goal is to make compartmentalization cheap. So instead of doing process-based compartmentalization, we would like to do in-process compartmentalization. We would like to scale instead of from tens of compartments to thousands or millions of compartments on a system. Um, so our whole thing, our, our extensions in the hardware are compatible with C. So we've designed our hardware-based fat pointers to be compatible with C pointers, um, both things required by the standard and things required by de facto C, such as, for instance, being able to take a pointer, go a bit out of bounds of your allocation, and then come back in before you use it. Um, and we replace the standard integer pointers with these, uh, with these memory capabilities, uh, which are unfortunate, so you cannot materialize a pointer to some random bit of your address space. Um, that's probably most of what I'll talk about with Cherry, but I want to give you just a little hint because I will probably mention it as I go through the talk. So, here we are. This is the first example in Kerrigan and Ritchie's The C Programming Language. It's on the first page. It's a trivial thing. Um, and we're going to dig into what, what all is involved with actually running this program in compiling. So first off, though, I'll point out that the example doesn't C uh, in, mo in a modern sense. So we'll have some declarations here. Um, and then, because that version is a little boring, we're actually going to look at a version where we use some format strings. Um, because otherwise printf is not very exciting. Um, you might think that ignoring the, vari the uh, variable arguments here, um, that this program is actually something along the lines of this program, where you have an array, and you write it to, to the standard output descriptor, and then you exit it. Um, in fact, you might think this program assembles to something like this. Don't worry if you don't understand it. Um, the short version of this trivial program is we load the address of the hello string and then we call write. Similarly, when, once we return, and we're lazy so we don't check our arguments here, so we don't check return values, um, we uh, load the exit value in the system call value and we exit. Um, so this is the simplest program you can write that, um, that implements hello world. And in fact, this program assembles to nothing like that. Um, so the, the simple assembly program here, it compiles down to nine instru instructions. One of the instructions of the eight, the eight uh, lines expands into two instructions. Um, and otherwise, it's trivial. The script binary is less than a kilobyte. Uh, and most of that is random bits of elf headers and mix ABI declarations and stuff that are totally irrelevant to this program, but they're always there. Um, you could get rid of most of them if you really wanted to. Um, so there's that. And then there's the minimal C version um, in, in printf. It's an over half a megabyte strips. And uh, most of it turns out to be malloc and localization. Um, but uh, 
interestingly, even an empty program will be this big. Um, because it turns out that malloc gets called before the program starts um, in all cases. And uh, also that there's always an invocation of protest somewhere hiding in the error paths. So you end up getting localization. So you might have to print a decimal point at some point. So how do we get this big though? So let's look at program linkage. Here's a simple command to uh, take a compiled hello world and link it into a simple hello world program. Um, let's, and then let's take a look at what that expands to. If you, run, if you have the, the dash pound 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 of all silly things, argument to your C compiler, it will tell you what it actually runs. Um, and here, it runs the linker. And you'll see the things you expect, you might expect as a program. There's hello world.o here, and there's uh, libc way over here, but there's all this other stuff. There's all these other object files. So let's, let's talk about where those come from and why they're important. Um, and that's really where most of this most of the, uh, the size comes from is things that those object files include. So first off, there's CRT1. This contains the underscore start function, which is the function that, where your program actually starts. Um, and it, in turn, sets up things in the environment, initializes uh, various structures, and calls main. Then there's a bunch of stuff here whose job it is to allow a variety of different initializers um, to work. Um, so the first, the CRTI um, supports two functions, which are horrible, horrible things. Um, there's the underscore net and underscore vnet. CRTI contains the bit of the function which sets up the stack to enter the function. And CRTN contains the bit, of the, the bit to return from the function. Any other program, any other file that's linked in can contain some random machine code. The linker concatenates them all together and then runs the crap. So you get this, it's just a terrible way to do something if you want to do it in C. Fortunately, there's a bunch of other mechanisms. There's CTOR, DTOR, constructors and destructors. Uh, not visible here. There are some other sections that I'll talk about later. Um, but all of this stuff calls in a bunch of things that, for instance, set up malloc, set up thread local storage, and we'll get to that in a bit. Um, so in the next, the next part of the uh, talk, I'm going to be showing a bunch of flame charts of stack traces. Uh, so you can see where we are in the program as we walk up and down the stack and call into different functions. These are all clickable SPGs. So if you go to this, this URL, they're online, and you can go play with them. It's kind of fun. Um, anyway, what I have in the talk is just screenshots. So we're going to start with, with the, we're going to start the program in the, we're going to start in the kernel, uh, in the, the basic model of a process in a conventional, uh, traditional Unix operating system. You take a pro you have a process magically, and it is there already at some point. So every process is other than an it is created by forking the process, which makes a complete copy of it, and then calling exec the usually. Um, to replace the entire contents of the new program. So we're going to start in the kernel looking at the exec VE um, and see what it does. So the first thing it does is there's this exec copy in args function, which does what it says. Um, it takes the arguments and environment variables and whatnot that were passed to the exec uh, system call and copies them into the kernel so it has, it has them all ready to go and it can put them into the new process. Um, it also can find the executable that needs to be loaded. So first thing it does here at the beginning is it allocates some memory to put all these things, um, and it copies all the copies in the program path and some other bits. Um, in, our, in our case, we don't have the arguments. We don't really have the environment, so it's just copying in the program path. Um, returning to uh, exactly the exact PE, we go into the rest of it. Um, we get into current exec v, which in previous is the actual implementation of the exec v system call, and it's used by multiple different process environments. So, like FreeBSD 32 and, and uh, on 64 bit machines that runs 32 bit processes, it will call current exec v, so there's some shared code here. Um, inside here, first bit, we look up the name of the executable. It'd be helpful if we could find the files we can load it, so we do that. 
Next, there's exec check permissions, it's a slightly misnamed function, um, which checks the file has the right permissions and it's executable and it's readable by you, whatever is required, and then it opens it, which is, seems confusing for something that does, that's called check, but hey. Um, and then there's exec map first page. Exec map first page does you know, what you'd expect. It takes the first bit of the executable, maps it into memory, and then so that it can start to parse the executable and figure out what sort of thing it is. Um, for instance, is it an ELF binary or an ADOT binary? Because for some reason we still support ADOT binaries. Um, and uh, so one interesting thing here is because we map the first page and because no programs have very large program headers, if you manage to build a program where the important bits of the program header don't fit in the first page, you can't run it. So don't do that. Um, fortunately, the tools won't let you in practice. You'd have to use something really silly. Um, now, we're going to jump into the uh, uh, image, exact ELF image act. Uh, this is the ELF 60, this runs ELF 64 format binaries. Um, and that was, and it, it, we're here as a result of having parsed the headers in the, uh, in the first page. Um, so one interesting thing about this function is, this is where a lot of the interesting stuff goes on. If you try to find it in the kernel, you will not find it. That string does not exist except in a compiled kernel because this is the declaration. Um, one of the, love, it's a lovely mess. This, this elf n macro in particular um, it's very useful. It means that our 32-bit and 64-bit ELF code is the same code. The problem is it means you can't find anything ELF related when you go looking for it with graph. Um, so that's just a side note. Um, if you're spelunking around, and want to learn more. Now, we're going to jump here. The first thing that happens in the image app later is this exact new VM space call. Its job is to uh, is to uh, set up your, your virtual memory address space. Um, and the first thing it does is it wipes out all your page mappings. Um, because you forked the process and you've got some random environment, you have no idea what's there, so you just need to get rid of it all. Um, it's worth noting that in more modern Unix environments, there's POSIX spawn or similar calls which do fork and exact all in one go, um, or do the, the things that you get from doing fork and exact, and most importantly, don't make a copy of the parent process's environment. Um, because you don't want it anyway. Um, but here, we, uh, we take all the stuff out, um, the address space, um, we uh, set up a few mappings, including we map the stack into the address space. So we have a, an initial region of memory for our uh, default stack. Now we're turning back out to the image act. Um, we start to map more things in. So we map the program's text segment, that's the part of the program which is executable as well as read only, some read-only bits. Um, we then map data, and BSS is all the variables that were initialized to zero uh, by default, and so they don't appear in the actual binary, um, but are mapped in as empty pages. Um, so we call out load section twice to, to set these up. And then we pop back to uh, the execve function. Now, we need to copy, we need, need to give the program its arguments and its environment, um, which means that, that they have to be in the address space of the new, of the new uh, execution. So there's this exact copy out strings um, and this weird um, health fix up function um, that I won't go into um, that copies these strings out. And, uh, yeah. um, and then we set up our initial register context enter the program at the start function um, with the right arguments, which I'll talk about in a moment. So now we return back to sysexecve. From here, we're ready to return to user space um, at the start function. Um, the stack is mapped into the address space. Um, the program is mapped into the address space. And the strings and environment, which I'll talk a little bit about more on the next slide, are mapped at the top of the stack. Um, uh, finally, the register state is set up. So, a little brief version here. Uh, let's, let's consider our stack. Um, for the 
for various historical reasons, all health programs, regardless of architecture, regardless of MPMS, um, follow the SCO I3D6 ABI um, for, for process setup. Um, and so things end up on the stack because they are there as though you had called the start function on an I3D6 machine um, with the correct arguments. So um, there's a bunch of stuff here. Um, there's PS strings, which is related to the program name, and it's mostly a fun feature, largely obsolete. Um, there's SIG code, which is the single trampoline, which you really move that, which does not belong to the stack. Um, but it's the, it's the part of, it's a little tiny bit of code which calls, um, which calls back into the kernel when you return from the signal handler. Um, there's some bits like the one-time linker path, there's the stack canaries, the, the random stack canary. Um, there's an array of all the page sizes in your system supports. Um, and there's the actual strings for the names and values um, in, uh, in your environment and the strings in your uh, argument list. Then there's the elf auxiliary arguments array, um, which I'll talk a little bit uh, about some of its uses later. Um, it's a useful way to pass metadata from the, the uh, kernel to the user space. For instance, it contains information about the program, um, the program binary, um, like its location in memory, so that uh, the runtime linker can look at it. Um, next up, there's the actual environment array. This is the array of pointers to name value pairs. Uh, there's the uh, argv, the argument array. Um, and there's argc. Argc is a little bit of an oddball. Um, you might expect, so C programs take to, typically take two arguments to make. They take argc, which is an integer uh, number of arguments, and the argument array. Um, interestingly, argc is always a long, not an int, um, because it ensures stack alignment is correct, remains correct, um, at least in theory. Um, so that's, that's a little oddity. And then the top of the stack pointer points here. Um, there's no actual reason this stuff needs to go on the stack. It's just historical convention. Um, and probably, so in, in the cherry world, we're going to move it off the stack because it doesn't belong there. Um, so in the, in the actual program, underscore start is called with this AP pointer, which also happens to be the stack pointer. Um, and that's used through this awful and slightly invalid C um, to find uh, argc, argv in the end environment. Um, so it's there, it gets worse though. Um, so now we're going to jump into underscore start and uh, actually start running the program. Um, not the part that the programmer expects maybe, but the program nonetheless. Um, so first, the first thing I will point out is most of the cycles of this program are spent in malloc. As you'll notice, there's this bit. Those are all malloc. That's all malloc. That's all malloc. Uh, basically, all the program does is allocate um, in practice. But uh, we'll hand wave at that, and then we'll look at the actual interesting things. So um, as, I, as I showed before, here's the underscore start program, and here's how it finds these arguments, the, uh, the arguments um, to pass to main. Um, and then the other half of the function, it's quite short, um, there's the handle argv function, uh, that will, uh, which uh, sets the environment uh, global variable, which is how you find your environment when you need it, and the program var name variable. Um, and now we're going to jump into it at TLS. TLS is thread local storage, um, and it's required for things where each thread might have a different value of something. <coughs> What we're actually going to see here is that we have per prop, is that in a modern FreeBSD program, each thread has its own um, localization environment. Um, so you might have a different, for instance, decimal point um, in your in your current environment. So we have to do a bit of, of initialization. So again, all the cycles are in malloc. Um, so now, here's where I said, when I said it gets worse, here's where it gets worse. So we need to find the elf auxiliary arguments array. Um, as you recall, the stack, the, uh, stack was laid out with um, argc, the environment array, or the, uh, um, the, uh, sorry, the 
virtual array and the environment array. Microphone. Microphone. Okay. Um, so let's see. Yeah. So there, there was the the argument array, the environment array, and then the auxiliary arguments. Well, we take advantage of the fact that things are laid out that way, and we use this bit of wonderful code, where we take the environment array, and then we walk off the end of it on purpose, and then we have the auxiliary arguments. As I said, it gets worse. So yeah. This, this was a it was a key find. But, um, in, in Cherry, we actually passed it. Um, yeah, in, in Cherry, we actually pass a new structure in which has pointers to the actual thing that we correct and back and all sorts of good stuff. Um, but here we are um, relying on the layout of the memory. So we use that, the open zero arguments, one of the things it has is a pointer to the program headers of the loaded binary. So we use that, we walk through the program headers to find this uh, field T in it, or TLS section. This is the initial values of any thread local variables that aren't zero. Um, we then allocate uh, some space for TLS, and we copy the values from the initialization vector, as well as zero in any, uh, any additional space that was allocated. Um, and we get that set up. So one interesting thing here, um, is K malloc, of course, makes extensive use of TLS because of threat aware malloc. Um, but uh, uh, but J malloc, of course, uses TLS. So there's a special entry point into J malloc um, for the purposes of making this initial allocation, uh, which does a bit less setup than a full default malloc and doesn't take make use of TLS. Um, and then finally, we set the TLS pointer um, on MIPS, uh, which is the where all my traces were taken. Um, traditional MIPS on FreeBSD um, tends would, would set TLS by making a system call. Um, and then it would also retrieve TLS by making a system call using the sysr function. It turns out this had really terrible performance because in fact, every time you called malloc, you had to get TLS. Um, so we were in fact making a system call for malloc and noticed until we profiled it. Um, fortunately, there is a there is a better approach which FreeBSD now implements, so we're, we're good there. But uh, that was a bit, bit of a shock when we first started profiling things. Um, so now that we have TLS set up, let's do the rest of it. So the handle static init is the next one. And it handles all these constructors. Um, there's a pre-init array section, which is an array of function pointers, which get called. Um, and then things can be declared to be in this array. It's, there's a similar, there's a CTOR section, which is about the same, and, and an init array section. Um, and then that horrible underscore init function. Um, interestingly, the only use that I have found for underscore init in FreeBSD is that the GNU startup code calls, does the CTOR setup through the init array. There's no reason to do it that way. They just did, um, or no, no, particular reason why that's the right way to do it. Um, and and it is considered deprecated, so uh, Cherry removed it. So now we're about ready to actually call the program. Uh, the part of the program we you know, think about is the program, so we're going to call it main now. So here's main. Um, and uh, first thing, it says all main does is call printf and then return. Uh, let's get to it. Printf calls vf printf, or yes, vf printf, um, which is uh, which has has the var args passed to it um, as a as a Veridac argument function or a object. Sorry. Um, there's an interesting as you as you can see here. There's a big stack of various printf bits which do things at different granularities before we finally get down to the real deal, which is this underscore underscore vf printf which does the real work. Um, so the first part that, that we'll see is we actually need to get the locale. Um, this is an optimization bug that I should fix. Um, but in the current FreeBSD printf, you always look up the decimal point on entry. Once it's cached, it's not such a big deal, but it is really kind of dull. Um, this string, for instance, does not have any decimal points in it, or certainly no 
no, no decimal points that printf is going to add itself. Um, so it's a bit silly. Um, but nonetheless, it's kind of interesting. Um, so we, we have to look up the current locale. So to do that, so to do that, we, uh, we get the current locale for the current thread. So we have to do a bit of thread local storage access. That requires some initial initialization. Um, and in fact, requires going into the environment to figure out what our locale is. Um, David Gisnell tells, tells me um, uh, that in fact I should rerun this trace with a uh, with an actually interesting locale set, because then probably all of the program's time would be spent reading that locale file. Um, but uh, I haven't gotten around to doing that yet. Uh, so now we've got a locale, and uh, we take that and we pass it to a bfprintf underscore l, which takes a locale, so we're no longer doing TLS access uh, at this point. And that goes into bfprintf, um, which also takes a locale. So, this code, this is, this is the comment at the top of the file. Um, this code is large and complicated, which is decidedly true. It's not TCP input, but... So I was going to ask, is that still, is that still accurate? Yes. Um, there is a dip, so there's an alternate printf implementation that X printf, it's Paul Henning's um, pluggable printf, where you can add your own format codes. It is table based, so it's considerably slower because it tells a lot of functions, but it is way easier to read and it probably has fewer bugs. Um, at least it has the potential to have fewer bugs. It doesn't have a thousand odd life function in external manipulation. Um, so, yes, it is in fact quick and complicated. So, the actual bit um, where we're going to work, where we're doing work, is that the is at the far end. The, the main thing, because it's the first time we've entered printf, there's a whole bunch of malloc here, uh, which is allocating a buffer, allocating a list of buffers uh, that are that are used uh, used for output. Uh, and I guess one point that's not particularly relevant to this this example, but which I think is interesting, is that all printf implementations in libc use bf printf, which take a a file star struct. Um, and in some cases, that might be a file star that reads out, writes out to a file. In other cases, that's got some magic buffer management functions that say write to the string in uh, sprintf. So it's kind of a cute hack. Um, there's a whole bunch of different implementation choices you can make here. And in fact, FreeBSD somewhere in the system probably makes all of them because we have at least five printouts. Um, so yeah, lots of fun. Um, so now let's get into the actual part where we're doing some work and you know, maybe print a string. So the first part, as I said, we do the actual lookup of the, uh, the decimal string. Um, next, the string is parsed in sections where everything up to a full format bit um, is handled at once. So we start off, we get this percent %s, um, and we, we do some parsing, and then we pass it on, um, and then gets, um, there's this S, uh, SFB write here um, is writing the whole string out um, to a buffer. Um, and we'll actually do the real write later because standard IO is a buffer file. Next up, we get the, the uh, percent %d. Um, there's a similar bit of string formatting there. Um, one kind of cute thing in parsing integers in previous D's libc implementation, but not lib standard curl, um, is that integers are printed backwards um, and, and printed from the back of the array. It's kind of a cute hack. Um, and you could do it either way, but I, when I ran into it, I thought it was kind of neat to work for the look if you're interested in string, string manipulation stuff. Um, and now the last bit, which is the slash n. Um, slash n, of course, in printf causes uh, buffers to be flushed. So we'll get there um, in a moment. So the first thing that happens is we, we, we uh, put together the whole the whole bit of little stringlet that we're creating, and then we check it. We run memchar on it um, to see if there is a new line character. Um, so if we do find one, we at the end after putting after uh, assembling the final string, we uh, have a uh, we make this call to 
to F flush, which actually flushes out the buffered string that you've been building up. Um, so we get into here, and we finally call right. Um, so you know, now, 30 minutes into the talk, we have called the right system call, and we have hello world. That, that is almost all of it, but there's a bit more, um, because we still have to exit the program, which is, of course, like everything else, more complicated than you might think. So, you know, we've, we've returned out of printf now, we've returned the inductors from main into underscore start, and so here, we're, we call inside, inside underscore start, we call exit with the return value of main. Um, exit, though, doesn't just call the exit system call to terminate the process. It has some more work to do. First, there are destructors that have to be called. Um, so there's this uh, CXA finalized, which calls destructors that, have, that were registered with the add exit call. So you can, as a programmer, say, I want to you know, call this function when, when I'm exiting. So you can clean something. Um, additionally, there's this cleanup function, which is always called um, and its job is to take any unbuffered I.O., any, any buffered I.O. that hasn't been flushed and make sure it gets written out. So if you haven't put that slash in it before, it would, the actual write would occur here. Um, because if you walk the list of all the open files that are, uh, that are buffered and uh, flush them. In this case, we've already written stuff out. There's nothing in the buffer. So not much is going on. So we actually call the underscore exit system call and the program ends. So, that is the life of a statically linked hello world. Um, now I'll give you a quick um, overview of a dynamic hello world, just for an idea of how that differs. It's not much different, but it's different. So here's the dynamic. Let's, let's, uh, we'll start here. So um, the first thing you'll notice is, if you look carefully at this, you can't find, you can't see main or start. Because in fact, the program spends almost all of its time in the runtime. Um, so here, you remember that memory layout that I, uh, that I showed you before, where this gets loaded in by the kernel. In addition to loading this, the uh, kind of dynamic program, the runtime linker is also loaded by the kernel. Um, uh, so yeah, so the runtime linker is also loaded by the kernel. And we start in the, run in the runtime linker start function rather than the program start the program doesn't have all the things it needs, such as functions, to do the, uh, the job it needs to do. So the first bit of, of the runtime linker that gets going is this uh, bit where the runtime linker, of course, could be located anywhere, so it needs to relocate itself. Um, so it does that. I won't go into details about relocation uh, today. Um, it then loads uh, libc, because we need libc in order to uh, have printf and malloc and the like. Um, and it relocates that, it's located in the memory. And then we finally call under star star over here on the side. Um, the overhead here is quite remarkable. Um, one of the things we found in general when I started doing this is we'd actually expected that, uh, for instance, the cost of simple lookups was something we couldn't add much overhead to, say, for uh, security. It turns out we can add all the overhead we want. Mm -hmm. um, because even ignoring system calls and page faults, a simple lookup in libc is about 90,000 instructions. So here we are. We're going to go actually call start. Start looks about the same as before, um, but there are a few differences. So let's take a look here. Um, so we call, there's, a, there's some corruption in the stack trace, um, so don't, don't take it too seriously. But uh, when, we, when we call in make from main, we call into printf. But we don't actually printf, we haven't resolved yet. Um, we don't resolve symbols um, at, the time we, at the time that we initially relocate the program, because it might well be the case that most of the symbols, the unresolved symbols in the program, aren't actually used. For instance, you know, calls to things in the error path um, in a program that's not going to have any errors, we don't want to spend time looking them up. So we do them lazily, and people come up the first time that they're called. Um, so they're named um, in FreeBSD, we have symbol versioning, so symbols are printf, and then FreeBSD, and it's in the, it's in the FreeBSD one monitor, symbol number, or a uh, symbol version set. 
Um, let's see. Yeah. So we. Um, so the first thing that happens is we, we call into a little stub, um, which says, "Oh, I need to look up. This, I need to look up what you really meant to call." Um, and there we dive into that. So we're going to look at. So we, uh, we call into here, we call into the MIPS RTL bind function, which calls the find symbol function, which goes and wanders around and does all sorts of stuff. Um, and finds the symbol, and then installs it in the table in place of the stub. So next time, it'll be cheap to call. We'll just have one little indirection where we have to pull it out of our table. Um, calling printf itself is basically the same, except that I think we've got maybe one more symbol to have in there. Um, but it's otherwise identical to the uh, dynamic program. So at this point, I'm ready to take any questions you might have. Yes. Uh, sorry, not uh, for the content of your presentation, but your presentation is excellent and wonderful. Uh, sorry. Not, uh, presentation itself, but your presentation, the appearance is mm, so nice that I'm really interested in what the tool you are making this graphics. Um, so it's it's um, it's a very slightly modified version of Brendan Graham's um, flame graph tool, uh, which is to say I deleted the sort. Um, and then I took, I generated stack traces by doing instruction level tracing of the Hello World program. So we have a QA group that's been modified to, to log the entire instruction stream. And then I used that to generate stack traces, stack traces in every single instruction. Um, and so uh, there's a bit of awk. I don't think I've published the awk, I could. Um, but actually generating the, the pretty part is all Brendan Gray's uh, fun graph tool, uh, modified for fun charts. Um, I don't remember if he's taken my full request. We had some communication. <laughs> if not, it's on there. The other question is between stack and stack and stack and stack and difference between stack and static. Dynamic and static chart makes not much difference in, in a feeling. <laughs> so it, is there any way to tell the difference between a static and a dynamic in, in a graphical wise? Um, I didn't really find a good one. I mean, I think probably the big point is actually that, um, so this is all of, is basically the static. Mm -hmm. That tiny little bit. Um, and then uh, there's a bit, there's a few more instructions because of the uh, dynamic, the lazy symbol resolution. But I think, yeah, I, I didn't have a really good way to show the difference there. Um, <laughs> how, how, do I, how do you tell the dynamic code like, from that graphics to actual library? Yeah, can I, is this library is all this Um So, yeah, so in, in this code, we, we uh, load libc. Um, we map libc into memory. Um, and we do some initial um, relocate. We do some relocation on it, um, and then the actual call um, here. At these all these cases where you see these at ats, um, those are where it's looking up a symbol that's in another um, in another library. So those were unresolved until we called the stuff. Um, and there's yeah, there's a bug in my current stack gen trace generator for dynamic stuff where um, the stub gets left there um, because of something I only realized as I was writing the paper, which is that there's two function entries, one of which is a tail call in the, uh, so there's only one return. And that's why there's this bug where an exit appears in the, in the ground. Uh, is, is that the, the left is the lower address, the right is higher address kind of thing? So the number is the length of the... Oh, no, so, the so what, what these are is, it's a sample of the, the current stack. So this is time. Ah, okay. um, so yeah, and it's proportionate to user space instructions. So cost of context switches and 
page faults and stuff is all delighted. Uh, but yeah, this is this is instruction by instruction. This is this Thank you all for coming.